Hi, welcome to the 10th and last video about the composition of my symphony for piano quintet. After several months of hard work, I can finally say, mission accomplished. The piece is finished and sounds just like I wanted it to. In the first video of this series, I said that the title of this movement would be Trasmutazione, Italian word for transmutation. So how does this title affect the piece? To answer that, we have to look at the definition of the word transmutation. According to Oxford languages, it is the action of changing or the state of being changed into another form. There are other definitions, but this is the one that best fits my intention for this movement. There is already an example of a piece that does this, Transfigured Night by Arnold Schoenberg. If you haven't heard the piece, I recommend you do. There is a change in the musical character more or less in the middle of the piece, which is in accordance with the poem that inspires it a poem by Richard Demel that talks about a man who accepts that the woman he is in love with carries the child of another man. The sadness of the woman's confession is thus transfigured, or transmuted. Therefore, after much reflection, I decided to do the same, to write a movement in two parts with some degree of contrast between them. Let's take a look at the score. The first part of the piece has four sections that I've labeled sequentially with numbers, as with other parts of the symphony, the music here is minimalist in style, although this is not due to the influence of minimalist or post-minimalist music, which I like but rarely listen to. It's rather inspired by the music of one of my favorite composers, Igor Stravinsky. I can't show examples of his music here because it's still copyrighted, but if you listen to, for example, his symphony in C, you'll find several passages with a somewhat minimalist sound. In them, you'll also notice something that he does in many other works, a recurring element or motif that changes its position in relation to the metric organization. This is something I've been doing myself for many years, most likely as a result of the influence of his music in my composition style. You can see it here. First, at the location of the strong dynamic marks. Each time they occur in a different beat. At the same time, there's a very slow and progressive expansion of the range, the ambitus, as it's known in early music practice. The highest note in the first system is an F-sharp, and you can also see that this note also appears in different places within the measures. This becomes a secondary element that is moving within the metric organization. In the second system, the range is extended to G-sharp, but F-sharp is not abandoned. Then, in the third system, the range expands to C-sharp. By the way, you can notice that these three notes are precisely the ones that the piano has been playing all this time. So, in a way, the piano was signaling the importance of those notes early on. On the harmonic side, the set is still 735, but I'm arranging the notes in a way that gives the music a minor quality. I want to do this because one of the characteristics of the second part of the piece is that the harmony will have a major quality, which makes sense with everything that I mentioned at the beginning of this video. In short, the music in this section is based on the contrast of a static layer, a combination of rhythm, harmony and character, with a moving one, which changes the stress of the beats and slowly widens the range of the music. I find this overlapping of ideas very interesting, and the other sections of the first part are an exploration of those same concepts. The second section shows a difference in the way the texture is achieved. The piano has now a constant stream of 16th notes, and the 8th notes, previously in the left hand of the piano, move to the strings. However, they are written in syncopation between two subgroups. Of course, this creates the feeling of 16th notes, but in a different way. The concept of the expanding range is still present, as you can see in the notes that I have circled. And, as before, this expansion occurs in different places within the metric organization. Finally, there has also been a change in the harmony. The set has been transposed to relieve some of the tension created by the stillness of the harmony in the first section. I'll keep doing this in the following sections for the same reason. One thing that I haven't mentioned yet is that another feature of the second part will be the use of a compound meter instead of a simple one. I needed to find a way to prepare the listener for that, so in the third section I decided to do something I already did in the second movement, a metrical overlap between the strings and the piano. By the way, 
Notice that the compound meter is not only written explicitly, but is also suggested by the dotted eighths on the piano. The range on the strings continues to expand, as always, and there are also melodic patterns that repeat, but not at the same beat. The piano has a very simple motif, but the rhythmic changes and the range expansion it undergoes give it another dimension and keep the part interesting. The fourth section serves as a transition between the first and second parts of the piece, and it's actually a variation of the previous section. The roles of the strings and piano are reversed, as a gradual accelerando occurs. At the same time, there is a gradual ascent in the register, which will be another difference between the two parts. The first is dominated by the low and middle registers, the second will incorporate the high register. Since the ascent has to take place over many measures, I can't just write linear progressions, which would be very boring anyway. I have to stay on the same register for a certain time, but at the same time give the impression that it's going up. The trick is to write a wavy line that occasionally reaches a higher point, while the lower ones progressively drop off. If you have ever studied species counterpoint, you'll have encountered this problem when studying the third species. So, all those hours spent solving species counterpoint exercises are worth it after all. There's another interesting feature, on the bass, an acceleration by shortening of the prevailing value, which could be described as a form of diminution. The transmutation has taken place, and we have reached the second part of the piece. There are several features that make it different from the previous one, but at the same time, there are also others that can be found in both. After all, I mustn't make a completely disruptive change. That would give the impression of two movements played without a pause, like what happened between the second and third movement. I need to preserve a certain degree of connection between the parts. Therefore, there's still a rhythmic organization based on 16th notes, and this helps us to integrate both parts into a single entity. Apart from the differences that I've mentioned before, there are others. The first is that the strings play chords in tremolo, which change from one measure to the next. This helps keep the music interesting, since the piano part is pretty much the same. Another thing I should point out is that the ostinato on the piano is very similar to the one it had in the third movement. The strings also played a tremolo chord there, so this first section of the second part, which I've labeled A, has a strong relationship to that movement, and if you recall, the set there was 828, the octatonic scale, so the title Transmutation acquires another meaning here. In a way, the music of the third movement has been transmuted, from the dark and gloomy character it had there, to the radiant and cheerful one here. Finally, I also consider this section to be a kind of narrative plateau, you'll understand why in a moment. An interesting thing about the chords of the strings is that the notes are very far apart, especially between the violins. I rarely like the sound that makes, but in this case, I didn't like the sound of filling in the gaps. On the other hand, the piano is really doing that, but I also found the hollow sound of the chords on the strings very appealing. At bar 68, the music descends into the lower and middle registers. It's like going back to the first part of the piece, I need this because I want to do a second ascent to get to A again. Now you understand why I consider A to be a plateau. I label this new section as B, and one feature I should point out is the stepwise motion of the bass. I also rarely do something like that, but in this case I wanted to. I need to signal to the listener that the end is near. I say I need to because I don't want the ending to feel off guard and therefore abrupt. So a bass that moves in stepwise motion sounds like a good way to signal that we're approaching the end. At the same time though, I don't want the listener to feel like I'm too obvious about where the ending will take place. Therefore, I plan to increase the anticipation of an imminent ending by making more ascents which then disappoint the listener by leading the music to a new section instead of the end of the piece. After a while, the listener will almost crave the ending something I want, but we'll never be sure when it will happen, at least not until it's a few beats away. There's a B1 and a B2, but both share the same concepts. Now we get to A again, 
and I decide to just repeat it as it was. At this point, I'm starting to think I'm writing a rondo. I usually plan the form of a piece in advance, but sometimes I let the music take shape while I write it, like in this case. I don't think the listener will think the piece will end with this repetition of A. It's too early for that, and more music is needed to create a proper sense of closure. The music descends again and then begins its third ascent. I decide to label this section as C, because I don't consider it a variation of B. The concept is the same, but the music is different. One thing I want to show you here is something that has been going on since the beginning of the movement, the crossing of parts, especially between the violins. I really like crossing parts, it helps me write more interesting lines, and the result also sounds different than writing the parts without crossings, even if the difference is very small. I can't do this very often with the viola and cello, but it does happen occasionally, and I even cross the viola with the violins too, though only in a few places. There's also a C2, which has some affinity with A. By combining simple and compound meters in this section, I can go back to simple meter without it feeling like an abrupt change. Perhaps now the listener will be waiting for the end of the piece, but I plan on tricking him a few more times before that happens. A new ascent begins, and this time I bring in the instruments one after the other to create a sense of accumulation. It's not a fugue or a canon, although it may be perceived that way. A returns, so this is really a rondo, but this time is different. It uses an additive time signature to organize the notes into simple and compound meter units before the return to simple meter at measure 108. In addition, the second part of A undergoes a compression, with each cycle occurring every half measure instead of every measure. The end has to be near, right? Sure, but not yet. Another descent precedes the fifth ascent, which reintroduces the concept of diminution, but this time by dividing the notes into smaller values as a form of embellishment. However, it's not only that. As the number of diminutions progressively increases, somewhat logarithmically, a sense of acceleration is also created. This ascent is also shorter than the previous one, just as the third A was also shorter than the first two. I'm doing this because compressions increase the flow of changes, which will inevitably feel like another sign that the end is near. The music reaches a fifth plateau that organizes the values into groups of three, thus alluding for the last time to a compound meter. It looks like the ending will happen here, and while writing this part I thought it would, but then I realized I needed to write more music or the ending would feel abrupt. Therefore, the piano makes a short descent and the music begins a more compressed and final ascent that concludes the piece on the third beat of bar 119, a somewhat unexpected position, I hope. The last chord on the piano has a major quality, but the chord on the strings has a minor one, and of these two the latter prevails, so the piece ends with a minor kind of sound. I debated this for some time, but decided it was acceptable because it's yet another deception to the listener, who will no doubt expect a major type sounding chord. And there you have it, that's the end of my symphony for piano quintet. As with the third movement, I won't play this one, but you've been listening to it softly in the background the whole time. With this video I conclude my series on this piece, which I hope you found interesting. I'm still deciding what my next videos will be about, you'll know in a couple of weeks. Until then, take care. Ciao.